Sly Cooper, Rise of Vexen Written by Tatsumari Korisuno Chapter 5 Once the gang had found a suitable spot among the trees and bushes to hide, Bentley pulled up all his scouting photos from the last time they had been to this fateful island. All that remained of the massive vault was a collapsed mountain making most of the photos useless. Ghostly remains of Dr. M's compound around the vault were still visible through the vines and seaweed that had accumulated. Vexen stood on a ledge that gave a perfect view of the island as memories from almost a decade ago came flooding back. It was here that she would begin her committed relationship with Sly. She couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if Sly hadn't jumped in front of Dr. M's shot. If she had lost her memory the way he had pretended, would Sly have told her that she was his partner in crime? Would she have lost her memories at all? Her thoughts were distracted when Penelope caught her attention, sitting on the next ledge over. The ride to this island had been a bit awkward as she came with them from Vegas. The little mouse had tried talking to Bentley a few times during the trip, but most of their conversations would only consist of a few words before dying completely. Vexen walked over to her and thought she could hear Penelope sniffling as though she had been crying. Is everything all right? Vexen asked softly as she neared. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, everything's fine. Penelope fibbed, taking her glasses off and trying to dry her eyes. Vexen smiled to herself and decided to sit next to her. So, I understand you helped the gang get into that vault? Vexen mused, tilting her head towards the island. Penelope dried the last of her tears and put her glasses back on. Yeah, that was me. Binley had me using my RC car to take out some security. Nothing much. We used our portion of the money from the vault to build the time machine. But I'm assuming you know what happened there. Penelope sighed, her voice taking on a disappointed tone. Vexen smirked, recalling when she watched Sly and Bentley take on the other Penelope who piloted a giant medieval mecha suit. I watched the fight between Bentley and the other you, and it was... something. But if that wasn't you, why aren't you helping Bentley set up the equipment back there? Penelope looked up to the island, fighting back her tears once again. Because whatever that other meat did to him... I think Bentley sees in me. He knows it wasn't me in that fight. I would never do something like that. But Bentley also knows that the possibilities still exist. What if I do the same thing in the future? What if I break his heart? Penelope asked, tears beginning to fall down her cheeks. Vexen pulled her close and hugged her tight. All this time travel stuff is loco, but you were meant to be here. Yes. Things happen, but you must try to be the Penelope Bentley remembers. Let him come to you. Vexen soothed as Penelope dried her eyes again and looked over the water to the island. Within another few minutes, Bentley had set up his ops base, poring over the data he had collected from entering the Cooper vault and called everyone together. All right. The last time we were here, this was a giant island-sized vault. Needless to say, that vault is no longer here. My scans have picked up some rather unusual seismic activity and thermal signatures from the island's center. Vexen, I need you to go over there and take some surveillance photos. I've set up points in your shades that seem like high-interest spots. Murray will take you over by rowboat, since we want to stay as silent as we can until we know what we're dealing with. Ivan, I would like you to teach Kit some combat fundamentals. Ivan grunted as his side ached. <sighs> I won't be able to teach her much, since I am <clears throat> unable to move very freely. But it'll be enough to keep her safe. Kit stepped forward and put her hands on the table. Wait, wait, wait. I, I said I wanted to come along with you until we found my folks. Not become a part of your... whatever this is. 
Besides, look at me. I'm a China doll compared to you guys. Kit exclaimed, motioning over her figure as she spoke. Kit, we're all in a unique situation here. Until we find your parents, I want to ensure you can handle yourself in the world. Bentley explained. Murray put a hand on her shoulder. Yeah, even though it might not be all the time, breaking stuff can be dangerous if you don't do it right. Vexen went to her and took Kit's hands in hers. Kit, we will do everything we can to look for your parents, but sometimes we won't be able to protect you if we are all busy. If you can learn some necessary combat skills, not only will it help you stay safe, but it could also help you in the long run. What if you decide that you want to go on your own and search for your parents? It's a big world with some very dark places, as you are no doubt aware. I thought we would be sticking to the cities, not here in the jungles. Just how dangerous are the things you guys do that would require combat training? Kit demanded, waiting for an answer. Bentley scratched his head and turned off the holographic projector in his chair. I'm not gonna lie to you, Kit. Some things we do can get pretty dangerous, life-threatening even. Murray and I worked with our best friend, the thief, for as long as I can remember. We've been shot at, nearly arrested, and even come close to dying several times. But we chose this life. Right now, we haven't stolen much of anything. We've been working with Vexen to get Sly back, as he's lost somewhere in time. That temporal tunneler could be the key to finding Sly. Bentley pushed a button on his chair and brought up a picture of him, Murray, and Sly as kids, holding on for dear life in a wagon while Murray sped down the sidewalk as fast as he could run. We all chose this life, and while we may have sprung quite a bit on you all at once, we want to make sure that you are safe, above all. Undoubtedly, an Interpol officer named Jonathan Winthorpe will follow us here. If you would like, you are free to go with him back to civilization when he arrives. As you said, staying with us will keep you safer than if you were alone, but our lives can be dangerous at times. And since you aren't used to this life, we want to make sure that you are safe. That is all we want. Ivan stood with the help of Murray, hobbling over to Kit and placing a hand on her shoulder. <sighs> I have a granddaughter. She just turned five this year, but even at her age, I have begun teaching her self-defense. I have made many friends in my time and also a fair share of enemies. While Mudzi may be in prison now, that does not mean he is no longer a threat. If he wanted, he might even get word to one of his associates to look for you. If you can't defend yourself, even if just a little, you may find yourself back where you started. And I doubt you want that. Kit shook her head slowly, looking down at the ground. I won't train you to become a thief, only to defend yourself. Kit sighed and agreed to learn. Ivan hobbled to a broader area where maneuvering wouldn't be a problem. Vexen and Murray set out on their mission, padding through the brush silently. Penelope could only stand as everyone went off to their assignments, feeling she was left behind. She was about to try and speak with Bentley, maybe to come to some closure about the whole thing. But no matter what she thought she could say, the words would escape her, and decided to retreat to the van where her remote helicopter and car sat in her bag. She picked up the aircraft, absently spinning the main rotor, when thoughts of her old life as the Black Baron came to mind. What's this? The young lady sitting here all alone? She thought, looking up and pretending that her alter ego stood before her. Oh, lay off it, Baron. She huffed to the wind. And here I thought you fought through hell to get back to this timeline. Was that a mere joke? <sighs> no, it wasn't. It took forever to get the parts without that other Bentley finding out what I was up to. Then why are you now sitting here when you should be embracing the object of your desire? That Vexen, she's a worthy opponent if I ever saw one, yes, yes? She doesn't stand a chance. She doesn't have the IQ to match Bentley. Besides, she's too focused on getting Sly back. True as that may be, you cannot let that dissuade you. You've come this far. Yes, events of an unchangeable nature have occurred, but you cannot give up. 
but where should I start? I don't even know what the other Penelope put him through. You only think you don't know because you refuse to acknowledge it. Bentley's heart was crushed right in two, and a rather messy one at that, if I do say so myself. But the fight isn't over. Not until... Not until I say so, she mumbled, looking past her imagined projection of the Black Baron, and watching as Bentley was madly typing away and drawing up battle plans. How could she win back what the other Penelope had so meticulously destroyed? The only thing in her favor was Vexen's willingness to give her the benefit of the doubt. She thought for a while, turning her attention to Kit and Ivan as they went through drills. What did I do the first time? She thought, remembering how she and Bentley met in an internet chat room. The whole reason they started chatting was to break into this very vault. It's funny how things can come full circle sometimes. She thought, looking around in her bag and bringing out her laptop. She searched the hard drive for the picture she had used while talking to Bentley, before connecting to his router and sending him a message. Bentley stopped when a message alert popped up on his computer. Who could be messaging me? He wondered, opening his email. The sender's email address was air underscore heart underscore babe, making Bentley smirk to himself. Opening the email, he chuckled again when he saw the badly photoshopped image of Penelope's face on a sensual body in a red dress with a short message below it. I'm Earhart Babe, but you can call me Penelope, it said. As he messaged her back, stabs of nostalgia, love, and pain began warring within him. The girl he had fallen in love with was right before him, but the girl who broke his heart was right before him. Two different women from two separate timelines, yet each was the Penelope that he loved. In the deepest parts of his soul, he still loved her, and in his mind, he knew this was not the same Penelope that broke his heart. Despite that, his heart and mind warred with each other, desperately trying to rectify which was correct. Tell me something, Penelope. What you want to know? Did you ever wonder why I never split off from Sly? Why it was that I didn't use my knowledge to make money? Sometimes, but you, he, and Murray are all family. Bentley heard something behind him in the leaves, turning to see Penelope standing behind him, holding her closed laptop in her folded hands, head down, and ears drooping. You let me into that family, and though Sly wasn't in the business for a time, I felt at home. I was an orphan like you guys, and I guess my becoming the Black Baron was just a way of trying to find a family that I never had. But with you guys, it was just there. She shifted her feet a bit unsure how to continue until Bentley spoke. <sighs> Penelope, I won't lie to you. It's tough for me. Even though you are nothing like the Penelope that broke my heart, it worries me that the possibility exists. Just give me some time. There's a lot to try and sift through, Bentley explained. Again, Penelope felt like she was trying for a long shot in making up for everything that her other self did to him. Bentley scratched the back of his head, looking over his shoulder at the screens once again. Could you give me a hand with this gyroscopic modulator? I can't seem to get the scanning sequence right, he asked. Penelope's eyes lit up slightly, making her smile. This wasn't what she had planned, but it would be a start. Well, here's your problem. You've got the spatial resonator calibrated all wrong, she chuckled walking over to the computer and readjusting the calculations. Bentley adjusted his glasses and set to work on his other equipment with a slight grin. Surprisingly, the trip to the island for Vexen and Murray was relatively easy. They only needed to stop once behind an outcropping of rock, hiding from the numerous security cameras. Once ashore, Murray set to work concealing the boat while taking cover in some nearby bushes. Vexen's first point of interest was on the island's north side, following the indicator in her shades. 
As she trekked through what remained of the jungle-like terrain, she thought about the journal from Karmalatra, her hand brushing her bag to feel the book inside. It was strange to hear that her family lineage was, at one point, a thief's. I guess it makes sense, given how easily I can catch thieves. She chuckled, pushing through the last few bushes to her first position, revealing a dock swarming with guards as workers unloaded crates of something. She tapped the side of her shades a few times, taking pictures of everything she saw, until someone near the shore caught her attention. No, it can't be. She muttered, pressing the comms button. Bentley, I'm sending you a live feed. Is that who I think it is? She asked, keeping her eyes on him. Let me see. Oh, great. That's Dr. M, all right. I've been wondering since Japan how he survived the Cooper Vault collapsing. Bentley groaned. Vexen zoomed in, noting that he was talking to someone just out of sight. If Dr. M is here, there is no doubt going to be all kinds of trouble. Remember those giant beasts of his? She answered, thinking about when she fought off his monstrous, mind-controlled beast that held onto Sly. Do I ever! Can you see who he's talking to? Bentley asked as Vexen tried to get a better angle. Mm, not from here. I need to get moving, though. I'll radio if I need more help. Vexen, out. She said sharply. What was Dr. M doing here? Wasn't he buried when the mountainous vault collapsed? And why did he need the temporal tunneler? Was he planning to go back and undo what happened to ensure that he was the one that got his grubby hands on Sly's treasure? She pushed aside the questions as she neared her next point of interest, carefully maneuvering between patrols walking through the forest. As she scanned the area, she found nothing there. I'm here at your second waypoint, and there's nothing here. Just the side of a mountain and a bunch of rocks. That can't be right. My scans are showing multiple sources of heat coming from that area. Well, I don't see a flippin' thing. Vexen answered with a huff. Sit tight for a moment. Let me run a few more thorough scans. Vexen huffed, her hand dropping onto her bag again, making a solid sound as it fell on the journal. Pulling it out, she shrugged and opened the covers, looking over the ancient text, which, to her surprise, she could understand. Or maybe that was the shades translating again. Whatever the case, she flipped through its pages to near the middle, where the words God's Blood caught her attention. Flipping back, the top of the page read God's Blood Control in neat handwriting. Controlling the God's Blood took time to learn, but with the help of my love, Slaidun Kamen, I have brought it under my rule. For my descendants that will read this, I pass this knowledge to you. Some may never be able to learn this, but I hope you will. To use the god's blood, you must make clear the action you want to take in your mind. Focus on it until nothing else in the world matters. If you can use the god's blood, your heart will follow, and you will move as the light at dawn, and the weakest points will become apparent to you, appearing as gold trails. But I also leave you this warning, my descendant. Your body cannot handle the mighty power of the gods for long. Vexen chuckled to herself. This god's blood sounded much like Tennessee Cooper's crack shot technique. Perhaps there was a crossing of techniques somewhere in their family lines. Bentley, how are those scans coming? Vexen asked, tucking the book back into her bag. Sorry, Vexen. I haven't had any luck. I need another minute or two. What about the time machine? Any luck there? Well, the chroniton modulator is out of alignment, the phase transducer is bent, and the reactor shell got cracked by those two-bit thugs. Penelope and I have repaired the shell, but it'll still be some time before we can use it. Right. Should I go to the next spot and come back later? Just be patient, Vexen. The deep scan is nearly done. Belly out. Vexen sighed when the radio went dead sitting down to read more of the journal when she heard a rustle. She reached to her thigh, cursing herself for still going for her pistol when it wasn't there. It appears that a curious little fox wandered into a restricted area. Get rid of her! Dr. M's voice shouted from what sounded like a speaker. Hired thugs came out of the brush, each brandishing a club or gun. Vexen sprang for the first in her clearing, kicking him away into another. <laughs> As she landed, a thug swept her feet from under her, bringing her to the ground. 
She recovered quickly enough, backflipping over the thug as he brought down his club. But she flipped high, seeing a couple of them aiming with their guns. Bending back, she watched the bullets fly past her nose, <laughs> continuing the motion into a second flip until she landed on her feet. She knocked a few more out, but they kept coming, some getting behind her and hitting her. At this rate, she was going to either be killed or taken by these guys, and the last thing she wanted was to face Dr. M. After kicking off her 20th opponent, she had a moment to breathe. Looking down at her bag, she set a hand on it. Well, now is as good a time as any, she thought. She closed her eyes and tried to focus on what she wanted to do, just as the book said. She needed to knock these thugs out. Opening her eyes, she moved to avoid being hit, punched him in the gut before kicking him off. She moved more quickly, but it wasn't enough. She tried to focus even more on her task, but it was difficult with so many people coming at her. Finally, she felt she had her focus. Gold haze began to appear on the thug's bodies, and her heart felt like thunder in her chest. All at once, everything slowed to a crawl. Was this it? Trying not to admire the moment, she ran from thug to thug, pounding their body within the clouds of gold before skidding to a stop. She took a long breath as everything sped back up and all the thugs sprawled to the ground. Yes, she felt winded, but nothing like she had before. She looked at her hands and smiled when Bentley's voice broke her thoughts. Hey, Vexen, the scans are complete. Something is there, but I can't tell from here. Try switching your shades to thermal imaging. Vexen turned back to where she was looking before, switching to thermal. Instantly, a large orange and yellow glow stared back at her while clouds wafted in front of it. What in the... She took her photos quickly, thinking she could hear more thugs coming toward her. The Nightwalk shot her into the shadows just as they came into the clearing, waking the others up and taking them away. Vexen waited until the area was quiet before making her way to the third and final photo area. When she cleared the brush line, she jumped back when her foot missed the ground where a sheer cliff stood. Far below, she could see a large form covered by a tarp and an enormous ring standing on end. She snapped a dozen pictures of everything, and as she panned around, she caught a glimpse of Dr. M, Leon Rousseau, and... Is... is that... Agent Darius Hunter? She thought, tapping the side of her shades, activating a small dish aimed towards them to pick up sound. It was garbled at first until her shades filtered out the background interference. Eventually, she was able to hear what they were saying. Vexen noted Agent Hunter's voice sounded odd, but hauntingly familiar as she listened. I don't think you understand, Mandrill. I spent the better part of a year redirecting resources and investigations. If you can't handle one simple distraction, I suggest you find another line of work. Hunter sneered, his eyes looking to have a dull yellow glow around them. Dr. M grit his teeth, standing to his full height while inching closer to Hunter's face. I'm not some puppet. You would be no closer to your goal without me. I was held back by that ingrate Connor Cooper, and I will not have history repeat itself. Dr. M sneered. Hunter looked to take a breath before answering. And for your services, I'm grateful. But your incompetence over the preceding month has been made painfully clear you are failing. My patience is running thin, Mandrill. I want my body to be operational by the end of the day. And a what a vexin and a right that Cooper gang. Mm. They're no doubt running reconnaissance on this island as we speak. Dr. M asked. Then deal with them. I want my body completed. If you cannot deliver, I will find someone who can. Vexen felt a wave of intense anger wash over her, dissipating soon after. She was about to call Bentley when she saw Agent Hunter reach up to the side of his head and rub his temple as if he were fighting a headache. Vexen quickly took the needed pictures and ran to where Murray was waiting for her. As she was leaving, Murray radioed. Vexen, can you hear me? He sounded as though he were trying to be quiet, making Vexen smile to herself as she ran. There was almost nothing peaceful about Murray. I read you, Murray. What's the matter? Be on your toes when you come back. 
A bunch of guards showed up around the boat. I don't think I could take them all. Vexen sighed. After her run-in earlier, it was only a matter of time before the deployment of more guards. Copy that. Stay low for another minute. I'm on my way. Vexen replied, taking a second glance at the cove before turning and running back to the beach. <laughs> Murray stayed as quiet as he could, trying to hide in a large bush near the boat. He spread the leaves out, watching the guards mull around, counting in his head. Thirteen Mississippi! Fourteen Mississippi! Fifteen Mississippi! As he was nearing the thirty-second mark, something rustled in the leaves beside him, making him pull back and stay as still as he could. The sounds of guards shouting and gunfire came from the beach for a moment, then fell silent. Murray didn't want to move, knowing something out there had just taken care of all the guards when a woman called out to him. It's all right, Murray. You can come out now. Murray squinted his eyes, clenching his fists and walking out from his hiding spot when he heard the voice. As he cleared the branches, standing in the middle of all the unconscious guards was the former Constable Neela. Rage burned through Murray at the sight of her. The moment Bentley became paralyzed came flooding back to him. Who? Bentley! I'll save you! I can't... I can't walk! The scene played over in his memory, his fists balling tightly as his whole body began to shake. His brow fell hard over his eyes, while his usually friendly snout contorted into a devilish snarl. You! You made Bentley unable to walk! Murray thundered, rushing forward, striking the ground where Neela had been a moment before, <laughs> kicking up dust and coarse sand. Neela held up her hands. Murray, please, listen to me, you are all making- Murray cut her words short as he rushed her again, his fist howling over her head when she ducked. <laughs> Murray's eyes glowed white as his fists began to sizzle with white smoke and dreamtime power. The Murray doesn't want to hear your excuses! You won't pay for what you have done to Bentley, you evil cur! He shouted, pounding the ground hard and knocking Nayla off balance. <laughs> As she was getting back up, Murray pinned her to the beach by her throat, drawing back his fist. Justice will be served! Murray thundered when Vexen appeared, trying as hard as she could to hold back Murray's enormous strength. Murray, no! Bentley wouldn't want this! Vexen sputtered, her arms and legs beginning to buckle under his strength. But she's the one that hurt Bentley! I know you want to get her back for what she did. I know this brings back painful memories, but you have to let it go. What would your master, the guru, think of you right now? What would Bentley think of you? Marie's eyes stopped glowing as he stopped trying to push past Vexen and release Nayla. She gasped and coughed, rubbing her throat. <coughs> Despite Vexen coming to her rescue, Nayla caught Vexen's cold stare over her shoulder. What are you doing here? I thought you were dead. Vexen sneered. <coughs> I've been trying to catch up to you, Carmelita. All of you need to get out of here as quickly as possible. Nayla said, looking as if she were almost pleading. Vexen crossed her arms and shifted to one leg. And why would we do that? Nayla grabbed her head, gritting her teeth in frustration. There's no time. You all need to leave now. Stop going after Cooper. Stop being a thief. And leave this all behind. Vexen ran to her, grabbing her shirt collar and hauling her from the ground, growling in her face. Again, why should we trust the word of a dead girl? Nayla was about to respond when the sound of guards closing in behind them made them all run for the boat. Murray paddled as fast as he could to get them away from the shore, the oars bending under his strength as he stroked. When they were a few dozen yards away from the beach, Murray began rowing in a zigzag pattern as mortar rounds detonated in the water around them. Thanks to Murray's strength, they avoided being hit. They hid for a bit in a cove as patrol boats passed by, returning to their landing point once they had gone. As they were getting out, Vexen roughly gripped Nayla's arm and spun her around. Now, answer me. Why should we trust you at all? I may have stopped Murray from crushing your skull, but you're still on my short list. Vexen snapped. 
Neela sighed and put a fist on her hip. That is something I should tell all of you. I only want to say this once. Vexen pressed for the answer for another ten minutes, but still Nela wouldn't budge. Finally, she brought her with them away from where the van was parked, serving as their base and safe house. Vexen, there you are! I was worried when I began to hear mortars going off in the ocean. You didn't get hit, did you? Bentley asked as Vexen dropped her shades into his hand to extract the pictures. Thanks to Murray's fast thinking, we didn't. But there's something else. Bentley hooked up the shades, waiting for an explanation, when she motioned to someone just out of sight. Bentley almost choked when he saw Nayla walk into the clearing, instantly activating most of his wheelchair's offensive capabilities. How in Einstein's relative theories is that possible? First Dr. M, and now Nayla? Did Miss Ruby escape and use her voodoo on her to bring her back? Bentley asked when Ivan and Kit walked into the clearing as well. Nayla caught sight of Ivan and lowered her eyes away. Ivan crossed his arms over his chest as his brow fell, wrinkling his forehead with a snarl. Hello, Nayla, Ivan said with a dark tone. Vexen looked up at him in surprise. You two know each other? Vexen asked. Ivan nodded, uncrossing his arms. Talk. We made a pact to work with Arpeggio and bring him the notes of Divici to Gesser. I should have known she would go to him on her own with the notes, even though all the signs of her coming betrayal were there. All right, I get it. None of you like me, but you are still in grave danger. Neela protested. You keep saying that, but what danger are you talking about? How are you even alive? Vexen demanded. Nila sighed, closing her eyes as she began. After I was defeated as Clockler, every bit of Clockwork's body was seized by the FBI and taken to an underground science laboratory headed by Dr. Darius Hunter. He was the lead scientist ordered to examine Clockwork's body in great detail in hopes of discovering some insight as to what drives criminals and how Clockwork's body worked. Dr. Hunter and his team found me in the throat and sent me to the hospital, where I stayed for almost two years in a coma. They performed numerous surgeries to remove thousands of tiny wires and circuits in my body. I remember being pulled from the body, but that was it. The next thing I knew, I was waking up to the face of Agent Darius Hunter. He filled me in on what happened before I woke up, telling me that he would wipe my record clean if I were to help him with his investigations. I took him up on his offer and planned to use him to get myself back into the criminal world. But... He was using me. Two years after I started working with him, I looked through his files to find something for leverage. That's when I found this. Nayla held up a small flash drive, handing it over to Bentley. After a thorough scan of the drive, he opened its only video file. The video depicted a scientist narrating his actions, dissecting what appeared to be Clockwork's head until it ended with a bright flash of light enveloping him. After I saw that video, I made a copy of it and was about to leave when I ran into Darius. He told me outright who he was. It turns out, Clockwork was aware of his surroundings when I took over and stored a large amount of whatever was powering him in capacitators. When the curious Dr. Hunter went fishing around in his brain, it triggered the capacitators giving Clockwork enough time to transfer his consciousness into Darius, taking control of him. He then used FBI's resources and his position as a senior agent to redirect investigations away from his goal. Rebuilding his body, hate chip and all. Once inside the new body, he would go back in time and undo everything that drove him to what he became. Vexen sighed heavily. Ivan pinched the bridge of his nose and spoke. You're telling me that the tyrant of all thieves is still alive and traipsing around the world in someone else's body? Yes, Ivan. He told me to my face. <sighs> Not long after that, he framed me for being a mole to someone named Braden George. Darius, or rather Clockwork, was the actual mole whenever the investigations would get too close to his operations. Vexen lowered her head and looked at her from under her brow. You're trying to go after Clockwork's body again, aren't you? That's why you want us to go away. Neela smiled and chuckled to herself. 
You always wear a shop when Carmelita. Yes, I am. But if my first attempt taught me anything, it's that I won't be able to do it here and now. It took a lot of time to manipulate arpeggio and gather the clockwork pieces, and even longer to get close enough to take the body. I'm too far away right now, but I have his notes. It may not be a year from now, but someday I will have his body. Vexen and Ivan laughed, trying to imagine her with a mechanical body similar to clockworks. Since you seem to be in such a revealing mood, care to tell us how Dr. M survived? Bentley huffed. With an annoyed laugh, Neela put her hands to her hips and shook her head. That pompous primate survived only on rainwater and his burning hatred of the Coopers for seven months. Apparently, Clockwork dug him up after becoming an agent, taking him to some of the best doctors and medical staff in the world. Once he was healed, he then recruited the good doctor to build his new body and oversee the creation of his temporal tunneler. Stunned silence fell over them until Vexen stepped up, shifting her weight to one leg and crossing her arms. <sighs> Normally, this would be the part where I pull my pistol and tell you that I'm arresting you. But, as you can see, I'm no longer part of that life. It'll be fun trying to stop you down the road, clock gla Vexen said, extending her hand. I'll be waiting, Neela smiled, smacking her hand away and disappearing into the woods. Are you certain that you want her to be your nemesis? She is a lot more trouble than you give her credit for, Inspector. Ivan warned, setting a hand on her shoulder. As she said, there's still a lot of time before she gets that body. By then, I'll have enough experience to bring down ten clockwas. Vexen said confidently. Ivan raised his eyebrows and shook his head. The thieving world was never this dangerous when he was in his prime. Bentley analyzed the pictures Vexen had taken, especially the photos with a the thermal filter, while Penelope watched him over his shoulder. She was slowly gaining back his trust, but there was still a ways to go. Kit watched from a distance on the edge of their base, absently rubbing her arm. Ivan was a good teacher, but she still wanted to go home to her parents. She didn't want to lead the life of a thief. Absently, she watched the passing photos, plans, and strategy when one of the photos caught her eye. Bentley, hold on. Can you zoom in on that picture there? Kit asked, pointing to one of the photos. Bentley brought it up, looking to Kit for cues to help her find what she saw. There, those two. Can you zoom in, maybe clear it up? Kit asked. Bentley looked to Penelope, who shrugged. Bentley typed in some keys, zooming in on two individuals Kit had pointed out and enhanced the image. When the picture cleared, Kit's face brightened into a smile as she pointed to the screen. What is it? Ivan asked, walking over to look at the picture. Those two. Those! Those are my parents! Kit exclaimed, fidgeting from one foot to the other. Her excitement vanished when Bentley opened his facial recognition program, and both of their names instantly appeared as internationally wanted criminals. Pablo and Amelia Cantalupa, both are part of a massive person trafficking ring. According to this, they faded out of existence about 23 years ago. Their last job was in Greenland, and their ring was responsible for a string of child kidnappings, and then selling them off. After that, their dealings dropped off sharply, living under the radar in Greenland. Kit flopped to the ground before Ivan or Vexen could catch her. No, 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 no. that can't be right. How, how could they not be my parents? Kit began to shout, her arms and chest burning while her breath came in shallow wheezes. Vexen knelt and hugged her close while Kit continued to mutter about how her life had been a lie, gripping Vexen's arm with all her strength. Bentley silently read on, realizing why Kit never had a missing persons file, calling Ivan over and allowing Penelope to see as they both felt a weight land on their shoulders. A missing persons report was never filed. Kit? Kit, listen to me. Focus on me, she said, reaching her arms around her, trying to break her out of the loop she had created for herself. Vexen had seen this before. Junior Interpol agents fresh out of the academy sometimes weren't ready for the most violent thieves. Sometimes it led to the agents having to use their service pistols, often curling into a panicking catatonic ball. Kit, just listen to my voice. 
Vexen soothed, tightly hugging her, trying to still her shaking. Vidrovaisya, Malenka de Tina! Ivan shouted. The noise instantly woke her from her frozen trance, breaking down into tears and crying hard into Vexen's shirt. Her whole life, her struggles, enduring her body being forcibly morphed and reshaped, and her hopes of ever seeing her parents again were all a lie! Vexen and Ivan walked with her outside the clearing, while Bentley looked over the photos some more to devise a strategy, while Penelope dug further into the Greenland candy cane vanishings. Winthorpe steadied himself, stumbling to the railing while trying to keep his lunch down, but the rocking boat and the rough seas didn't help much. The captain approached him and leaned on the railing, pulling the cigarette from his lips and blowing a cloud of smoke into Winthorpe's face. The smell pushed him over the edge, nearly falling overboard as he retched into the water. Ye be new to the waves, aren't ya? The captain asked, chuckling as Winthorpe wiped his lips off, spitting what remained into the ocean below. You could say, say that. How long till we get to the island? The captain took out his pocket watch, looked to the sky, and then down to the ocean. We be there in another few ticks, the captain said, pointing towards the front of the ship. Winthorpe breathed a sigh of relief, happy that he would finally get off this rocking roller coaster. He left the deck and went into the cabin, where the rest of his army of officers waited. All right, when we get to the island, I want you to assume that everyone is your enemy. Darius Hunter is our primary target, but if you see Vexen or any of her associates, they will be brought in without harm. Sir! The lot replied, saluting him when the captain came over the loudspeaker. He best be holding on to something. These waters be getting rough. Incoming fire! Winthorpe went up to the helm, watching as mortars and torpedoes came charging at them. This be more than I bargained for. He did not say we be facing explosives and torpedoes. Winthorpe's hand brushed against the shock pistol strapped to his leg. Keep going straight ahead. I'll get to the front and take out the torpedoes in the water. He called, pushing the capacitors to full charge in the pistol while standing at the bow. All right, Carmelita, let's see if your old pistol still got it. He thought, aiming for the first of his targets. A bright blast shot from the pistol, hitting the torpedo and detonating it on impact. Winthorpe smiled as he pointed the gun at his next target, blasting each one with a single shot. After about five minutes of blasting, they made it close enough to shore that the torpedoes did little good. Winthorpe was first on the coarse beach, knocking thugs out or blasting others with the shock pistol. He almost felt like he could see Carmelita fighting with him, but his thoughts were interrupted when something huge landed on the beach. Looking up, he could see it was Dr. M with another of his enormous creations strapped to his head. Well, this seems familiar. I won't make the same mistake twice. He said, holding the beast's arms forward with a bank of missiles, firing all twelve. Winthorpe changed out the pistol's battery and aimed for the rockets, detonating each one in the air. Dr. M fired the second bank, then fired a third from the creature's back while Winthorpe blasted each missile. When the ape runs out of missiles, I should be able to hit the control circuit on the creature's head. That should get the doctor out of the driver's seat, he thought. But as he detonated the last missile, the creature's tail swept in. With almost no time to spare, Winthorpe backflipped over it, barely missing the sharp spines on its top. You think you can just hit me while my guard is down? Uh, it won't be that simple, little agent. By the by, what's your name? I recognize that pistol, but I don't recognize you. The name's Agent Jonathan Winthorpe, Interpol officer, enforcer of the law, he said proudly. Dr. M doubled over in laughter. Oh my, you sound just like that worthless carbonita fox. Take my advice, kid. Go back home while you can. You're so far out of your depth, you can't even see the show, Dr. M challenged. 
Winthorpe recharged the capacitors, aiming at him directly with a cold look in his eye. The name is Agent Winthorpe, and I don't back down. He shouted, firing off a large shock round. <laughs> Ivan and Vexen finally calmed Kit down enough to get her to talk. It would take some time, but they would help her get back to a healthy life if that's what she wanted. Kit nodded in understanding, asking to be alone and think about what she wanted. Vexen assured her they would be nearby, and walked back into the camp where Bentley was about to reveal his plan. This plan took a little longer than I wanted, but I think we could pull it off. This picture Vexen took using the thermal filter reveals some massive generators. They are going to power the temporal tunneler. And now that we know who Darius Hunter is, we can safely assume that his new body is under that giant tarp. My scan showed Agent Winthorpe is on the way with a bunch of agents from Interpol. So if we play our cards right, we should be able to get Winthorpe and Hunter to take care of each other. But why are we stopping Hunter if his tunneler will take us to when Sly is? Couldn't we just piggyback a ride through it? I want to get Sly back as much as you do, Vex. But since Clockwork is in the driver's seat of Hunter's body, that means he knows when Sly is. He could go to that time and kill Sly Tung Comet, ending the entire Cooper family before we arrived. My time machine is almost up and running. I just need to calibrate a few more parts. We still have the chunk from the museum to scan and send us to the right time. But for now, we need to ensure Clockwork stays as far away from Sly as we can get him. Vexen huffed, crossing her arms and motioning for Bentley to explain his plan. The first phase of this plan will be taking out Dr. M before he can use any of his creations, which I'm sure he has somewhere nearby. That's what he did the first time we came here anyway. Murray, you're the only one that can fight him head to head, so you'll be in charge of keeping him busy in combat. Yeah, I've been looking forward to punching that smirk off his face again, Murray shouted enthusiastically. The second phase will be to take out those generators so we can't use the tunneler. Ivan, you will be the one handling that. A boulder is sitting in the right place to roll it off its perch and into the generators. While you're doing that, I'll be hacking into the main computer to keep any backup generators from being activated. Penelope will be our eye in the sky to keep us appraised of troop movements. Vexen, your job will be to get Winthorpe's attention and lead him straight to Hunter, I mean clockwork. If he's as good as you were, he should be able to handle him easily. My calculations say he has a 99.9999999999% chance of beating him. What about that last little bit? Winthorpe may be good, but he's just a kid. And it may be Dr. Hunter's body, but it's clockwork behind the wheel. Who knows what crazy plans or combat training he has in that brain of his. Vexen pointed out. That's why you'll be standing by out of sight. If it looks like Winthorpe needs help, you can swoop in and- A loud explosion ripped through the air, catching the group's attention. They raced to a nearby cliff to see Winthorpe and his forces fighting against Dr. M and one of his enormous mutants. Oh no! Winthorpe got here earlier than I thought! I... I gotta rethink our whole strategy! Bentley whined, going back to his laptop and beginning to plan. This is a perfect opportunity to sneak in unnoticed from the south side. Vexen pointed out. That won't work. Penelope chimed in. My RC helicopter is flying over there right now and the whole place is crawling with guards. There's no way to get there unnoticed. What about your van, Muri? Doesn't it fly? We could use it to get into Sekov. Ivan stated, pointing to one of the pictures that Vexen took. Penelope shook her head and readjusted her glasses. That won't work either. The whole place has dozens of ground-to-air missile banks. We'd be blown up before we'd get close. Well, we can't just sit here and do nothing. Clockwork may be using this fight to cover up the use of his tunneler. Not to mention that Winthorpe could get creamed out there any second. Vexen shouted back. I can get you there, Kit said, breaking the tension of their argument. Everyone stopped and looked straight at her as Bentley rolled up to her. Kit, what are you- I can get you to the island unnoticed. 
My illusion magic can make us invisible to anyone, and I can get you past that fight. Kit, I thought you didn't want this for your life. Ivan said. I didn't. But the life that I knew was a lie. My family was a lie. I, I've known you for a couple of weeks at most, but you are all willing to help me find my family, and still willing to help me have a normal life. You're the closest thing to a family I have left. And if sticking with this family means I'll be breaking some laws and facing danger, then so be it. I just ask that I can have a chance to talk with those who claim to be my parents. Bentley sighed, trying to wrap his head around the rapidly evolving situation. Uh, uh, all right, he stammered. Uh, all of our assignments are still the same. Kit, once we get ashore, you'll stick with Ivan. Once finished with your assignment, Ivan and Kit will search for the Cantalupas and find out what Kit needs to know. Now let's do this thing! Bentley called, folding up all his tech and wiping the router clean of data as they packed into Murray's van. All right, Murray, whenever you're ready. Kit called, spreading her tails as a light came to life on each tip. From inside the van, the air looked like it wavered all around them before returning to normal. Just don't go too fast, otherwise the spell won't hold. Kit instructed as Murray shifted the van into gear. How will I be able to tell if I'm going too fast? Murray asked, edging the van to the water and activating its hover wheels. The air will begin to ripple, Kit explained. Murray made sure not to push the throttle too much, watching the air in front of him as he eased on the speed until he reached the limit. The journey was a delicate dance of stops, careful directional planning, and close calls. Once across the water, Murray made a mad dash for a nearby cove, nearly breaking Kit's hold on her camouflage spell. But the fight between Winthorpe and Dr. M made them unnoticed. All right, team, you have your assignments. When we're through, meet up at the Temporal Tunneler, Bentley called. Ivan and Kit ran off to their assignment on the far side of the island, dodging guards as they went. Sometimes they would rely on Kit's illusionary magic to get by in a tight spot. Ivan here. We are in position. All right, give me another few seconds. And... Done. Take it down, Ivan. Both of them heaved the boulder into motion, rocking it over the edge as it bowled down the hill. No sooner had the rock demolished the generators than the two of them were running back through their hidden trails for the docks. The guards and hired hands scrambled to move crates further into the island's center. Do you see them? Ivan asked, pushing aside a branch enough so they could see. Not yet. They might be... There! Kit pointed to two gray-brown canines moving a crate on a cart. Kit began shaking. Her arms and legs wouldn't respond to what she wanted to happen. She tried to step out and confront them, but something prevented her from doing so. It was as if she was fighting against her own body. Kit, what is the matter? Ivan whispered, putting a hand on her back. Kit didn't respond, her legs trying to take a step. Her eyes were wide, and Ivan could hear her breath quicken. He knew Kit was teetering on the edge of backing down but she might never find closure if she didn't get her answers now while her resolve was highest. Stiffly throwing the branch aside to make himself as evident as possible, Ivan stepped out from the bushes and stood in the way of the cantalupas, crossing his arms and flexing his chest to appear as imposing as possible. Instantly, six others reached for their guns and leveled their sights at him. Who are you, and what do you want? The woman asked, stopping the heavy cart with some effort. It is not me who wants anything. She does. Ivan growled, looking over to the bushes where Kit sat, shocked out of her state of indecision by Ivan's bold move. With all the dock hand's attention on her, Kit stood to her full height and stepped onto the wood floor of the dock, her steps sounding heavy and angry. The Cantalupas stared at her, bewilderment on their faces as they looked at each other to understand what was happening. Kit made sure her footing was firm, glaring at both of them before meeting their stare. Hello, Mama and Papa, 
she said with a malicious sneer. The cantalupas could only stare for a while, studying her until the man recognized her. Catherine? My little kitty? Is that- Don't talk to me like I'm your daughter, Pablo. I've learned what happened. The woman's face lit up, taking a few steps forward. After all this time, you're here. She softly exclaimed. Massive tears ran down Kit's cheeks as she snapped her livid glare to Amelia. You dare act as though you shed one tear for me, Amelia? Were they the same tears my real parents shed when you took me? Kit widened her stance, holding her hand wide as hazy flames appeared in each palm. Kitty, what are you- In Greenland! Over 20 years ago, you kidnapped children to be sold like meat! Why was I spared for so long before you simply stopped caring? Amelia's face fell as she looked back to Pablo and shook her head, taking a breath to begin. 23 years ago, we raided a town to gather all the children we could find just as winter began. We waited for night to fall, then began taking them. It was easy, and those that resisted, we killed. Once we had enough, an arctic fox came and put you in my arms, demanding that we pay her. You were too young for our clients at the time, and we had no intention of raising a kid of our own. But when I saw your face, and the rabid insistence of your mother demanding money made me realize that you wouldn't have a life here. So I handed over the $50 in my pocket, and we adopted you as our own, retiring from the person trafficking business. And it was the best choice we ever made. Amelia reached into her jacket and pulled out an old photo of Kit when she was no older than seven, riding on Pablo's shoulders and laughing heartily. As he continued, Pablo walked forward, taking the picture and holding it out for Kit to see. When we lost you in Vegas, we spent five years looking for you, using every avenue we had at our disposal. Darius Hunter found us and told us he knew where you were, promising that he would reunite us with you once we helped him with this project. But you're here, safe and sound. When Kit saw the picture of her former self, unchanged, untainted, and with only one tail, she began to clench her teeth hard enough to creak. Tears built in her eyes, streaking the mascara down her white fur as she clenched her fist tight. I'm just a piece of property to you, aren't I? I'm just a piece of property to everyone I've ever known! The fire in Kit's hands began to burn pure red, lighting the area in a dark hue while power seeped from her eyes. You let me believe a lie for my whole life? Did my mother even tell you my name before handing me off like some unwanted garbage? Kit snarled. Amelia slowly shook her head. No, she didn't. But you were never a possession. You are our daughter, Catherine. The flames around Kit's hands slowly faded. For many years, a child meant nothing but money to you. Why should I believe that you stopped out of some heartfelt kindness? Kit wrapped her arms around herself and shut her eyes tightly. I endured so much for ten years, believing that you would come and find me. That I would go home, and everything would return to how it used to be. But now, thanks to Vixen and her friends, they rescued me and showed me the truth. I'm not your daughter. You're just trying to cover up the blood on your hands. She said, before hearing a yelp from Amelia and Pablo, and then from Ivan before something struck her over the head, and everything went black. Murray waited for Winthorpe to ease his assault on Dr. M, then jumped out from cover. Taking on his aboriginal ball form, Murray bounced high enough to knock the doctor from his control space, tackling him to the ground. Dr. M rolled across the sand, baring his teeth as he watched his latest chimera creation fall over. You bubbling mess of caveman's feces! Do you know how long it took me to make that? He shouted, looking at Murray for a bit. Oh, it's you! Have you come back to do the job right this time? Dr. M asked. Your reign ended long ago, Dr. M. If you want to try and prove you're better than me, bring it on! I'm better than I was then! Murray shouted back, flexing hard. 
Now, you've only managed to increase the size of your muscles. Your brain is still as small as ever. <laughs> Dr. M sneered. Murray punched his palm hard, making a satisfying smack that echoed his thunder off the rock walls around them. Then let me show you how big I've made them. I may not be smart, but I still know how to crack skulls, Murray said in return. Dr. M growled, lunging for Murray only to be thrown back when Murray hit him with a Dreamtime punch into a pile of rocks. <laughs> Dr. M sat up and rubbed his chin, impressed. Well, you're quite a bit stronger than the last time we fought. I'll give you that. But you still think like a caveman. <laughs> Boorish and simple. Smack it hard enough and it'll give in. Dr. M shouted. Murray clenched his jaw hard, rushing in and slamming Dr. M with his shoulder. The ape caught the rush, eventually stopping his forward movement until a stiff punch forced Murray back. Murray's dream time focus broke, but Dr. M still had difficulty overpowering Murray. Both of them snorted, hissed, and grunted, trying to push one another back. Murray looked over Dr. M's shoulder, watching as Vexen neared the area, sneaking past Winthorpe. The attempt caught Winthorpe's attention, instantly drawing them away from the fight between Murray and Dr. M. With Winthorpe and the soldiers out of the way, Murray shoved the ape off, hitting him with a punch that rocked the very sand they stood on. Dr. M held his gut, gasping for air. You know, you still make my blood boil, Dr. M, but you will never be more powerful than the Murray. You want to know why? Murray asked, cracking his knuckles. Oh, do enlighten me, though I doubt you ever could. Your wretched Sly Cooper has you so dumbed down, you can hardly think for yourself. Murray felt rage boil within him. His fist tightened and his chest bulged. I will never undercut my friends! Murray roared, slamming his fist down on Dr. M with enough force to throw a cloud of sand into the air. When it finally settled, Murray shook himself, tugging at his tea to get the sand out of the folds. Murray here. Dr. Reb is down and taken care of, he radioed. He waited for a response when something hard hit him in the back of the head and knocked him out. <laughs> Vexen raced along the shore, now and again looking back to ensure Winthorpe was still following her. The occasional bolt from her old shock pistol would fly past her, kicking up dust and dirt when it would miss. She felt like she had run across half the island and still hadn't seen any sign of Hunter. Bentley, come in. Any sign of Hunter? She asked, jumping away from another close shot by Winthorpe. He might be close to the tunneler. Try going that way. Uh, by the way, have you seen Ivan, Kit, or Murray? No, I haven't, but I may have missed them since, you know, I'm running. Ha <laughs> ha, very funny. I'll look from here. Oh, no! The shock in Bentley's voice spurred her to run faster, rounding a corner and diving into the shadows, waiting for Winthorpe and his troops to pass by. What's the matter, Bentley? Hunter has them! He, he has Kit, Ivan, and Murray tied up near the tunneler. Vexen was about to ask what she should do when Hunter's voice came over the loudspeakers. Attention, Miss Fox, or Vexen, whichever you go by these days. I know you are here on Kane Island and what you're trying to do. That little wretch Neela is harder to get rid of than I thought, but that isn't why I'm calling for your attention. I have three individuals who seem very important to you sitting in the same chamber as my tunneler. They are all seated directly in front of it, which will be extremely dangerous in approximately ten minutes. Come to the room, and I will give you back your friends in exchange for you. The system howled a high note for a moment as the speakers cut out. Don't do it, Vexen. It's a trap. One of the oldest in the book! Penelope called over the radio. I know it is, Penelope, but I can't let them get killed. Sly would have my hide if anything happened to you guys. 
What about you? You're family too! Sly would hate himself if you got hurt trying to protect us! Don't stop using that brain of yours now. Keep thinking. I'll try and stall Hunter. Vexen out. She radioed back, taking off her shades and turning them off before running to the chamber housing the tunneler. Just as Hunter said, Ivan, Kit, and Murray sat unconscious tied together on a platform next to the tunneler. Without trying to hide, Vexen ran to them, grabbing a knife from a nearby table to cut the ropes until she slowed to a walk in the middle of the room. Taking in her surroundings, she saw a large cage hanging above her friends and automatic turrets trained on them from either side. Slowing to a stop, she tried to think how she would get her friends away from danger until she heard the sharp sound of expensive dress shoes on the concrete behind her. Well done, Inspector. I thought you would charge straight in, but your experience with Le Paradox has sharpened your mind. Hunter complimented, his steps coming closer and closer. You have what you want, now let them go! Vexen demanded, turning around to see Hunter a few yards away from her. With a snap of his fingers, the three friends were drugged from the platform and onto the floor a few yards away from the tunneler, the rough treatment waking them up. What do you want from me, clockwork? A wave of rage washed over her while Hunter rubbed his temple, closing his eyes for a moment to fight off what appeared to be a migraine. <laughs> yes, it is me. What I want is to kill you. Hunter moved in a blur, racing up to Vexen before she could react, pinning her to the ground with an iron grip around her throat. Rage fueled his strength, his fingers digging into her neck while Vexen clamored for some leverage against him. Vexen heard the sound of Ivan and Murray calling to her from far away, but Hunter's grip prevented her from turning her head. You are almost as competent as Cooper, and if I leave you alone, you will no doubt find a way to stop me. If I kill you, it will be all the sweeter to see the look on Cooper's face when I drop your corpse at his feet. He will pay for taking everything from me. And you finally pay for rejecting me! Hunter growled. In one last desperate act, she remembered the knife and swung as hard as she could, only to have the blade pulled from her grip and driven through her forearm into the ground. Vexen tried to scream, the searing agony blazing through her arm and into her shoulder, but Hunter's grip prevented it. Light began popping in her vision, the sounds of Murray and Ivan becoming farther and farther off, while blackness closed around her. Was this it? Was this where her journey to find her beloved ringtail would end? The pressure around her neck disappeared all at once, allowing her to heave for air. Her vision was still blurry, but she could barely recognize the outline of Hunter dodging shots from somewhere to her left, shouting something before running away. A few moments later, another shorter, stout shape entered her vision. It almost sounded like someone calling her name, her real name. As her vision cleared, she could see Winthorpe and his troops surrounding them. Miss Foss, can you hear me? He called, just as Vexen's hearing returned. She was about to respond when her throbbing arm stopped her, crying in pain. Don't move. I'll get that out first. Good grief. If we had been another second later. Winthorpe said, looking over her arm while dabbing away the blood with baby wipes. Winthorpe, you have to go after- Not until I make sure you're all right. Jackson, I need a hand with this. He called as a burly soldier walked over to her. This will sting a lot, but it's the only way to get it out, the soldier said, placing a hand on her forearm and gripping the knife as firmly as he could. Vexen looked over to her friends, seeing they were now sitting up with the soldier's guns pointed at them. Taking a few deep breaths, Vexen nodded as the soldier hauled out the blade. Another scream of pain echoed through the cave as Vexen sat up, coddling her arm until Winthorpe began quickly wrapping it with a makeshift bandage. Well, Winthorpe, I gotta hand it to you. You've caught me. Vexen muttered as he wrapped her arm. You didn't make it easy, Miss Fox. But I never thought I'd be arresting my hero. Just feels wrong having to take you in. If you say they coerced you or were forced to- Winthorpe, stop. I did this because I wanted to. I knew what would happen if I chose this life. Now it's caught up with me. 
I just hoped to have seen Cooper before it happened. Please, Miss Fox, tell me something, anything, that doesn't make you into one of those criminals that you work so hard to put away. Jonathan, there's nothing that I could tell you that wouldn't also make you a criminal for tampering with evidence. You've done what you're trained for. Vexen sighed, holding out her hands, palms up. Now put the cuffs on me. You know what to do. Where's Bentley? Winthorpe asked, reaching into his back pocket and pulling out a pair of handcuffs. I honestly don't know, but I have one request. The girl there is Kit. Help her as much as possible. She's had a rough life. Winthorpe nodded, reaching for her wrists. Carmelita Matoya Fox, you are under arrest for... He was interrupted by a loud buzzer and flashing lights as the tunneler behind them began to groan and whine. Bentley and Penelope appeared, racing to cut the rope holding the other three. We need to get out of here now! That tunneler is going to activate any second! I thought you made sure it had no power! Murray shouted as everyone followed Bentley out of the cave. I did! But there must be a set of hidden generators I didn't know existed! A rising hum filled the room until a tearing howl exploded from the tunneler, throwing them all to the ground as a shockwave ripped past them. A blue swirl of energy hung in the ring when the sound of jet engines descended into the cave as clockwork landed. His new body was twice the size of his old one and sported numerous banks of missiles and energy weapons along his wings. His sword-like talons sang as he walked, scraping the ground with each step he took as he spoke in his synthesized voice while turning his glowing gaze to them. <laughs> Sentimental fools. And they seems to be the downfall of everyone around the Kudo clan. With the beat of his wings, the jet engines roared again as he flew towards the portal. Everyone sat stunned for nearly a minute, until Bentley and Penelope began to babble so quickly that Vexen had difficulty hearing them. This is terrible! The implications of this far outweigh anything that we faced before! If Clockwork gets to slide before we do, he can start going after his ancestors like a common! That would send ripples throughout history and could be worse than what the Paradox had done! We need to stop him now! We might become encased in stone! If Slide to common is dead, the Cooper Vault will never be built! Vexen desperately looked to Winthorpe and grabbed his hand. Winthorpe, listen. Right now, we are all in danger. If you let me go now, I will turn myself in when I get back. Just let me rescue Slide. Seconds passed like hours as Winthorpe debated, looking to the soldiers, then to the Cooper gang and the new additions to this ragtag team. With a final huff, he reached into his belt pocket, grabbed the key to the cuffs, and unlocked the one he had placed around her wrist already. Go. I'll be waiting. He said, setting a chair upright and sitting with his arms and legs crossed. Vexen commanded Murray to get his van, while Kit helped tend her wound more thoroughly. Murray's van roared up within a few minutes, skidding to a stop and opening the doors. All aboard! He called, revving the engine. Vexen, Kit, Penelope, and Bentley piled into the van, but when Vexen looked back, she noticed Ivan standing off to the side with his hands behind his back. Ivan, come on, we don't have a lot of time! She called, but Ivan only shook his head. No, Vexen. This is as far as I go. Everything you need to know, I have taught you. Besides, I am old, and I don't think these bones have what it takes to keep up with you. Vexen got out of the van and ran to him, hugging him tightly, carefully avoiding his hurting side. Thank you for everything, Ryu. I will see you again, won't I? Vexen asked as Ivan took her hands and knelt to her level. It is a possibility. I might look up some old friends for another poker game, or you might find me back in Egypt. What about Winthor? He and the agents might try to capture you here. Ivan smirked, then chuckled in his throat. <laughs> Go. Your friends are waiting. 
Vexen hugged him one last time, which Ivan returned, then ran back to the van and jumped into the front seat, slamming the door shut as Murray peeled out up the ramp and through the portal. Hang on, Sly. I'm almost there.